Okay, we're going to finish chapter three today uh, for substance use and abuse. Uh, we're going to start right here at ADHD, if I can never figure out what I'm doing. Here we go. Okay. 9.4% of children 2 to 17 in the United States have been diagnosed with ADHD in their lifetime. 9.4%. 8.1% of U.S. adults between 18 and 44 have been diagnosed with ADHD. 129 million children worldwide, about 7.2% of the children in the world, have been diagnosed with ADHD. In 2016, 6,100,000 uh, children have been diagnosed with ADHD, up from 4,400,000 4, in 2003. They liberalized the uh, definition of ADHD, uh, and now more, f more young females are being diagnosed with ADHD. ADHD is caused by a depletion of dopamine. Amphetamines are used to treat ADHD because they increase dopamine and block its metabolism. Uh, there are about 10 million prescriptions of Ritalin per year. That's uh, the chemical name is methylphenidate. Uh, there's about 7.7 million prescriptions prescriptions of Adderall, that's also known as D-amphetamine. Uh, 5.8 million prescriptions of Stratera, uh, atomac, atomoxetine, and Silert, we don't have any numbers on. Amphetamines work on ADHD about 75% of the time, and this may be because uh, as we have discussed before in other classes, or maybe in this class, ADHD, there's lots of different uh, things that look like ADHD, and unless somebody actually has ADHD, um, then uh, it will not, uh, then the uh, dopamine, it, the uh, stimulants will not uh, affect the ADHD or the, the symptoms. Research shows that children taking amphetamine therapy for ADHD in the long term have an increased risk of alcohol and drug abuse as adults. Half of children with ADHD have comorbid uh, oppositional defiant disorder. If left untreated, these individuals are more likely to progress to more serious problems such as stealing, vandalism, and arson. Uh, I had out uh, some... Uh, One of the main uses for amphetamines throughout the 20th century was as a diet pill, uh, but every time a new drug hit the market, it seemed to cause its own set of problems. A good example would be Finfin. -fin. Um, the, they were two amphetamines, uh, fentermine and uh, fenfluramine. It was marketed as Finfin, -fin, as I said before. Uh, given in tandem, the drugs caused heart valve damage in select women. It was taken off the market in 1999. Uh, my wife actually took this in, we were in Mississippi. Wait a minute, what year would that be? In the uh, middle 90s. So it's still on the market. She was taking it uh, to help her lose weight uh, when we were living in Mississippi. Stimulants are and have been used all over the world for centuries. Uh, cot is uh, used in the Middle East. Betel nut is used in the Far East, uh, that's Asia. Uh, Yohimbi is used in Africa. And ephedra is used in the Mediterranean era, area. Cod is a mild stimulant found in the Middle East. Smuggling of this drug in the United States has become more prevalent as more and more immigrants from the area come into the United States. The key stimulant in the leaf is cathinone, which uh, evaporates if the leaf isn't used within 48 hours after harvesting. This substance is said to produce an effect between caffeine and methamphetamine. Uh, methcathinone is a synthetic version of cathinone. A uh, quick story, uh, stationed in Egypt. Um, the, <laughs> there in the middle, we're in the middle of the desert. Um, the, we were supplied by the Egyptians. Uh, this was, uh, it was an RDF base. Rapid Deployment Force Base, 
uh, we weren't supposed to be there um, at the time. Uh, one of the reasons we were there was to uh, stop an invasion of uh, Israel. Uh, and we were given, uh, it was a secret, it was a secret base, okay? And nobody cares now, but I mean, back then it was a big deal because uh, most of the, the countries in the Middle East were, were anti-Israel uh, um, and uh, they were anti-Semitic. And of course, here we were trying to keep the Egyptians and uh, anybody else in the area from attacking uh, uh, Israel. And we were being supplied by the Egyptians, interestingly enough, but by the Egyptian army. Anyway, they would, uh, we were in the middle of, de of the desert. And if you've ever, well, the desert is, is a lot of the desert is, it looks like a big open road. It looks like a, uh, it was once a dry, uh, lake bed or something. Anyway, that's, that's where we were out there in the middle of nowhere. Uh, there was a road, but, uh, a lot of times, uh, instead of uh, driving on the road, which kind of curved around. Uh, they just drive straight, and they would drive across the desert in their deuce and a half. Anyway, we were being resupplied by the Egyptians, and uh, a lot of times they were chewing this stuff. And sometimes, I, 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 sometimes they would get goofy. Sometimes, I, I don't know if they fell asleep. I don't know what the hell was going on. Anyway, every once in a while, these guys would come, come barreling into camp, and... Uh, they would be so stoked out of their heads that uh, that uh, they'd run right through the, the tents and stuff. And it was a little, a little unnerving. A lot of times you'd, you know, you'd stop them and, and they'd have these wild eyes. They, they didn't have a clue what they were doing. Anyway, they ran over. They never killed anybody, of course. I mean, that would, that, that would have been a horrible tragedy. But uh, they knocked down a lot of tents. <laughs> They knocked down a lot of stuff, okay, in, in their trucks. I don't know if those trucks had brakes. The drug is used extensively in the Horn of Africa and on the Arabian Peninsula. In Yemen, half the population uses cot, and a family may spend one-third of their income on the drug. This drug is the driving force of the economies of many of the countries in the area. The drug is used socially. Chronic cot use can cause physical exhaustion and suicidal depression when uh, withdrawn. This is the Horn of Africa down here, Somalia, Djibouti, Eritrea, this area right here. Kenya's right down here. Anyway, that's uh, Ethiopia's over here. Um, this is the Horn of Africa, and that is the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. There's Oman and Yemen and Saudi Arabia. Synthetic cathinone is known as methcathinone. Well, this is not is only found sparingly in the United States. It is much more common in Europe and, in fact, represents 20% of the illicit drug use in the Russian Republic. Methcathinone is much more intense than COTS and is an addictive is as addictive as methamphetamine. Uh, with the drug, there is more dopamine reduction. And so Parkinsonism is, uh, is more common with methcathinone. Uh, Parkinson, Parkinson, Parkinsonism is uh, or where you develop Parkins, Parkinsonian symptoms, uh, such as tremors and um, a depleted gait. You can't walk very well. Betel nuts uh, come from the betel nut palm and are found all over Southern Asia. It is used extensively in India, Pakistan, the Arab world, Taiwan, Malaysia, the Philippines, New Guinea, P Polynesia, southern China, and Africa. It was used fairly extensively in Vietnam. Uh, worldwide, 200 to 450 million people use this substance. In Taiwan, 17% of men and 1% of women use the substance. One recent controversy in Taiwan is the betel nut beauties who man betel nut kiosks while dressed provocatively to attract male customers. Uh, some authorities are demanding more modesty uh, for fear of comprising, compromising public morals. Uh, I was curious about this. I wanted to see if, uh, if it was still happening in uh, Taiwan. 
I looked it up before uh, when I was uh, looking over my lecture, and I discovered, by golly, they're even less dressed than they were before. <laughs> so evidently this practice is still going on. The interesting thing is, uh, I don't remember when I put this lecture together, but uh, her picture is still uh, very, very famous uh, in Taiwan. She's a betel nut beauty. The active ingredient in betel nuts is aerocholine, which induces an incre increase of epinephrine and norepinephrine in the, C in the central nervous system. This causes a mild euphoria, excitation, and a decrease of uh, fatigue. Uh, the juice of the nut is dark red and stains the mouth red to black, and it makes your teeth black, as attractive as that is. Uh, it gives you naturally, it gives you red lips, though, which is kind of kind of cool, I guess. Um, Aerocholine and muscarine are fairly toxic and cause mouth and esophagus irritation that might lead to cancer in the uh, in this area. Seven percent of chronic users will develop cancer if they live that long. In India, betel nuts are mixed with uh, sweet sweetened tobacco to make a pro product known as gutka. So gutka is betel nut and tobacco mixed together. Yohimbine is the extract from the Yohimbi tree found in Africa. The tree is a member of the coffee family and the extract is bitter and spicy and often brewed in a similar manner to coffee. The active ingredient in Yohimbine is an alpha-2 adrenergic antagonist that increases the neurotransmitter norepinephrine. Yohimbine has been used for centuries as a mild aphrodisiac and sexual rejuvenator. Yohimbine's sexual side effects seem to stem from its ability to increase penile blood flow. It has been used to treat erectile dysfunction and is, re is reputed to induce sexual arousal in women. Uh, the drug does increase blood pressure and heart rate. Male enhancement products include male performance, Yohimbi power, manpower, and aphrodine. It is also found in Sobe Energy. Yohimbine serves as a local anesthetic. Uh, in larger doses, it may produce a mild euphoria and sometimes hallucinations. At toxic levels, it can produce paralysis of the respiratory system and death. Ephedra is a bush that grows in deserts all over the world, including the deserts of Arizona. Uh, the drug that it produces is ephedrine, uh, this drug is a mild to moderate stimulant that is used medicinally to treat asthma, narcolepsy, allergies, and low blood pressure. Ephedrine is also known as Marwith and Ma, Ma Huang and has been used medicinally by the Chinese for 5,000 years. Ephedrine was first synthesized in 1885 and for decades was the only effective treatment for asthma. Ephedrine's effects are less severe than amphetamines though a toxic level is more likely to lead to psychosis. Ephedrine and pseudoephedrine are the active ingredients in many cold products. They also make up the molecule that is converted to make methamphetamines and methcathinone. The substance has also been implicated in sports doping scandals and so is banned by the NFL and illegal in Ohio. The sale of cold remedies is now controlled to prevent the hoarding of enough of the substance to convert into the more destructive drug. Caffeine is the most popular stimulant in the world. It's the most popular mood-altering drug in the world. It is the most popular habit-forming drug in the world. 85% of the people in the United States consume substantial amounts of caffeine every day. Caffeine is naturally found in coffee, tea, chocolate. Uh, caffeine is put in many products to give uh, us energy. It's uh, found in soda pop, most energy drinks, and over-the-counter energy supplements like 5-Hour Energy. I think that's what it's called. Water is the most widely consumed beverage in the world. Tea is the second most widely consumed beverage. Tea has been consumed in China for 4,700 years. Tea has uh, become ritualized in many cultures, like Japan and China. 
The English discovered tea from the Portuguese traders and the country became obsessed with it to the extent that they fought two wars to get China to trade with them. To this day, four o'clock is tea time in England when everyone stops and takes a spot of tea. That's what the Brits do. They, at four o'clock, they also eat biscuits, which are cookies. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a time for uh, for eating biscuits. <laughs> Coffee was first cultivated in Ethiopia in 650 AD, and from there it slowly spread into Europe, though along the way many cultures banned it as an intoxicant. In the United States, each coffee drinker consumes an average of 20 pounds of coffee a year. Eight ounces of brewed coffee will deliver about 135 milligrams of caffeine. That's a cup of coffee. Eight ounces of instant coffee will deliver about 95 milligrams of caffeine. Eight ounces of uh, decaf coffee will still deliver about 7 milligrams of caffeine. Archaeological evidence indicates that indigenous people in, the, in Central America grew cocoa uh, products as early as 2,600 years ago. From the Mayans, the practice spread to the rest of South and Central American power brokers, such as the Aztecs and the Incans. Cocoa uh, was uh, originally marketed in Europe as an aphrodisiac, but soon it became merely candy. Cocoa was a, has a small amount of caffeine, but other active ingredients in the substance act as stimulants as well. Uh, theobromine uh, is, uh, is one of those substances. In the late 19th century, Century and early 20th century, manufacturers of cola, soft drinks, uh, replaced cocaine with caffeine as an energy booster. Some of the caffeine uh, comes from the cola nut from the African cola tree, but most of it uh, today comes from caffeine removed from decaffeinated coffee. Energy drinks began with the invention of Red Bull in 1987. So there you go. Red Energy drinks have only been around since 1987. That's only 33 years ago. Red Bull delivers uh, 80 milligrams of caffeine in an 8.3 ounce can. Red Bull also contains taurine, ginseng, guarana, glucose, B-complex vitamins, minerals, and carbohydrates. Eight ounces of brewed coffee delivers 135 milligrams of caffeine. Red Bull only delivers 80. Sobe Adrenaline Rush also delivers 80 milligrams of caffeine in an 8.3 ounce can. Starbucks uh, two shot, double shot uh, delivers a whopping 105 milligrams of caffeine in just a 6.5 ounce can. So there's more caffeine in uh, the double shot uh, than there is in a cup of coffee. 12 ounces of Mountain Dew delivers 54 milligrams of caffeine. 12 ounces of Dr. Pepper delivers 41 milligrams of caffeine. 12 ounces of Pepsi Cola delivers 38 milligrams of caffeine. 12 ounces of Coca Cola delivers 35 milligrams of caffeine. 16 ounces of Rockstar delivers 240 milligrams of caffeine. 16 ounces of Full Throttle delivers 200 milligrams of caffeine. 16 ounces of Monster delivers 660 milligrams of caffeine. 16 ounces of Mountain Dew uh, Kickstart delivers 90 milligrams of caffeine. Uh, there you go. So those are all your energy drinks. Uh, a new phenomenon that has hit the bar scene is a drink. Uh, is to drink vodka mixed with Red Bull, and this is known as Birch. Uh, it is reputed that this mixture will slow the process of getting drunk and result in less of a hangover the next morning. Uh, none of that is true. It's, uh, it, it's, 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 a, it's an old wives' tale, or it's an old drunk's tale, I guess. Uh, it actually accelerates uh, the alcohol into your system. So it's really dangerous to mix caffeine and, uh, and alcohol. You get The alcohol gets into your system faster. Deaths due to overconsumption of Red Bull have led to banning the drink in several countries. It is banned in France, Denmark, and Canada. Guarana is a national drink of uh, Brazil. Uh, guarana comes from the Guarana shrub, 
which produces beans that have uh, about two times the caffeine as coffee beans. Uh, the Brazilian drink normally uh, delivers about 30 milligrams of caffeine in a 12-ounce can. Uh, actually, they tried to bring this stuff to the United States back in, uh, let's see, when was that? Back in the 90s, but it uh, didn't take, uh, it wasn't very popular. Mate is a plant uh, whose leaves are brewed like tea. Mate is a national drink of Argentina and delivers between 35 and 130 milligrams of caffeine per 8-ounce serving. 3% of the world's caffeine comes from mate. Mate, truly kind of interesting. Pope uh, Francis uh, is from Argentina, and uh, he drinks this stuff, mate. Caffeine is a very bitter chemical. It's an alkaloid, and that's why it's so bitter, uh, in a class of chemicals called xanthines. It is found in more than 60 plants around the world. Uh, the half-life of caffeine is 3 to 7 hours. Uh, it takes uh, 15 to 35 hours for caffeine to completely clear your system. We are not the heaviest uh, caffeine consumers uh, as people from the United States. The Swedes average about 425 milligrams of caffeine per day. The English average 445 milligrams of caffeine per day. Americans only consume an average of 211 milligrams of caffeine a day. 17% uh, of it is from tea, 16% is from soft drinks, 60% is from coffee. About half of all Americans drink 3.3 cups of coffee a day. 20% of U.S. adults consume more than 350 milligrams of caffeine per day. 3% of U.S. adults drink more than 650 milligrams of caffeine per day. 65% of the 450 different soft drinks produced in the United States contain caffeine, including Mountain Dew and all of your colas. Caffeine is used in several prescription and over-the-counter medications. It's uh, used in bronchodilators, decongestants, diuretics, analgesics, uh, alertness aids, appetite suppressants, menstrual pain controllers, as a vasoconstrictor, it can work on migraine headaches as well. Caffeine works by inhib inhibiting the effect of adenosine. Adenosine is a neuromodulator that depresses your mood. It induces sleep. It has anticonvulsant properties. It causes low blood pressure. It slows the heart rate, and it dilates the blood vessels. Caffeine's effect is controlled by heredity. So... Whether you are sensitive to caffeine or not sensitive to caffeine, it all has to do with your genes. A uh, good example is my family. Sorry. Uh, my dad used to drink pot after pot of coffee. It didn't affect him at all. I told you this before. Um, I'm, I'm not sensitive to caffeine. My son's not sensitive to caffeine. However, my mother was very sensitive to caffeine. It would cause her heart to palpate. I have a brother who uh, also, I, I, I think I told you this story. One time he was driving to Norfolk, Virginia from Muncie, Indiana. And uh, he was falling asleep. So he decided he would drink coffee or he, a Mountain Dew. He decided he would drink a Mountain Dew. Uh, he started hallucinating while he was drinking the Mountain Dew. He ended up in Maine. Somebody had to, I, my dad had to go up and get him because uh, he was uh, freaking out, literally freaking out. So he was very, he's very sensitive to caffeine. Of course, he told me at the time he, he called me up on the phone and said, don't drink, don't drink Mountain Dew. It's, that stuff's poison. Uh, it'll make you go crazy. And of course, at the time, I was drinking five or six cans of this stuff every day. So it didn't affect me nearly the way it affected him. So it has to do with heredity. And I have it on both sides of my family. Uh, the good and the bad and the ugly, I guess. To those sensitive to caffeine, 350 milligrams per day may cause anxiety, insomnia, gastric irritation, high blood pressure, nervousness, and flushed face. One study where subjects were given 500 milligrams of caffeine showed a 32% elevation of the stress hormones 
for an extended period of time. Um, I, I was looking this up the other day. Actually, somebody wrote a, a paper on it or a uh, article critique on it. Uh, they've uh, what they determined was that about 10% of the population isn't sensitive to caffeine at all. Now, uh, obviously, it's, I'm I'm one of those people, and so is my son, and so was my father. So we'll see if my grandson is. Caffeine is lethal at 10 grams. That's about 100 cups of coffee or 185 cans of Mountain Dew. Uh, those are 12 ounce cans, not the big 16 ounce cans. Uh, in susceptible people, too much caffeine can trigger nervousness. Caffeine is one of the substances that people prone to uh, panic attacks should avoid. Uh, counselors should ask their clients about their caffeine consumption as sensitivity in excess amounts might create artificial anxiety. Uh, drinking coffee is uh, one of the, the things that society tells us we should do. I do not drink coffee. I don't like the taste of it, uh, but... Uh, some people may be causing themselves uh, undue anxiety and undue uh, and possibility of panic attack just because they're consuming caffeine. Excess caffeine consumption can lower the fertility in women. 350 milligrams per day will not only make it less likely that a woman will get pregnant, but will double the chance of a miscarriage. Uh, when my daughter was pregnant, my daughter got pregnant uh, later in life. She was in her 40s. She was 42 when she got pregnant, and she gave birth at 43. So she knew this that was her only shot uh, to have a, a child, probably. And so she was very, very careful, and she didn't consume any caffeine. And, of course, the two of us, uh, she, was, she teaches biology, and I worked in medicine for 30 years, and I'm, uh, I'm an old lab tech. So both of us were very much aware of all of the milestones that she had to go through. Uh, we both knew that she needed to make it make it to 22 weeks uh, to make sure she had a viable, viable fetus. Uh, and as it turned out, of course, my grandson was born um, on time with, with without any problems. And it's because my daughter was so good. She didn't consume anything she shouldn't, including caffeine. Uh, she certainly didn't drink or smoke uh, during her pregnancy. And uh, the kid's uh, pretty close to being perfect, I guess. Close enough, I guess. <laughs> Excessive caffeine consumption has also been implicated in a woman's developing benign lumps in her breasts. Researchers also feel that caffeine may make it difficult to lose weight because caffeine triggers the release of insulin, which metabolizes sugar and in turn creates a deficit in the blood, which causes hunger. Since there are a number of different hereditary uh, structures that dictate sensitivity and tolerance to caffeine, talking about amounts and effects varies from one individual to another. High caffeine consumers may actually uh, get sleepy when only consuming small amounts of the substance because it activates the adenosine receptor sites. Withdrawal symptoms from caffeine begins after 12 to 24 hours of abstinence and peak after 24 to 48 hours. I've given up caffeine a couple times uh, in my life. Uh, I didn't have any withdrawal symptoms, uh, so that's why I'm assuming I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, susceptible to it. I'm, it just doesn't do anything to me. The symptoms can last for two, two days to a week. Throbbing headaches, sleepiness, uh, fatigue, lethargy, uh, depression, decreased alertness, sleep problems, irritability, flu-like symptoms, nausea, vomiting, muscle pains, or stiffness. Okay, now we're going to talk about tobacco. <clears throat> Nicotine comes from the leaves of the tobacco plant. The tobacco plant is a member of the nightshade family, which also includes tomatoes, belladonna, henbane, and petunias. It also includes... Uh, is that stuff? Skunkweed. <laughs> as curious as that is. As a matter of fact, skunkweed and tobacco look an awful lot alike. Of course, skunkweed smells like skunks. You probably have never seen it. Uh, it grows in swampy areas in the, in the Midwest. We, we used to have skunkweed on our property, and we had a, a swampy area back in our woods, and it grew back there. In the United States, 90% uh, of the tobacco is delivered to its users as cigarettes. 
In India, 85% of all men use tobacco in the form of chewing tobacco. So they don't smoke cigarettes over there, they chew tobacco. Tobacco came to the old world from the, the Americas and it, it originally was smoked in pipes. In the 18th century, people began chewing the leaves and snorting the powder into their noses as snuff. Smokeless tobacco continued to be the most popular use of tobacco until World War I. Around World War I, packaged cigarettes became popular in the trenches of Europe. Uh, this was possible because cigarette rolling machines improved. Cigarettes used a milder form of tobacco, which allowed deeper inhalation of the tobacco. Mass production produced lower prices. Advertising popularized the product. More aggressive marketing brought the product around the world. Heavy smokers in the United States will smoke 20 to 40 cigarettes per day. Uh, U.S. tobacco users spend $89 billion a year on tobacco products. 24.9% of the population over 12, that's about 60.5 million Americans, smoked cigarettes in the past month. 51 million Americans smoke cigarettes every day. 13.6 million Americans smoke cigars every day. 2.2 million Americans smoke tobacco in pipes every day. 7.7 .7 million Americans use smokeless tobacco every day. Smokeless tobacco comes in three forms. Moist snuff that is put in the mouth next to the gums. Oh, this is called snuff. Uh, powdered or dry snuff, which is drawn up the nose, which is not that popular, popular in the United States, but it's something that they do in Europe. Loose leaf uh, chew, which is put in the mouth and chewed. And of course, that's fairly popular. It used to be popular in baseball, but they don't, they don't want to allow it anymore. People can't chew tobacco anymore in baseball. The active ingredient in tobacco is nicotine. Nicotine is a highly poisonous alkaloid that is bitter, smelly, and colorless. Tobacco leaves hold 2 to 5% nicotine. Smoking tobacco delivers nicotine to the brain in 5 uh, to 8 seconds. Smokeless tobacco delivers nicotine to the brain in 3 to 8 minutes. Cigarettes contain 10 milligrams of nicotine. But a typical smoker will only get one to three milligrams in their system with each cigarette because they are only puffing it from time to time. Now, the rest of the time, they're just kind of holding it and letting it burn. 70 milligrams of nicotine is fatal, so that's a good way to kill somebody is to inject them with nicotine uh, since it'll be in their system. Oh, great, I'm telling you how to murder people. Chewing tobacco will deliver 4.5 milligrams of nicotine to the brain, while snuff will deliver 3.5 milligrams. The first cigarette of the day will raise the heart rate by 10 to 20 beats and the blood pressure by 5 to 10 units. Nicotine affects the central nervous system and disrupts the following neurotransmitters. Endorphins, epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, and acetylcholine. Nicotine mimics acetylcholine, filling nicotinic uh, acetylcholine receptor sites, exaggerating the cholinergic effects, increasing your heart rate, your blood pressure. Uh, it increases memory, strangely enough. It increases your learning. It's a good way to learn. It's by smoking cigarettes and studying. Uh, it uh, affects your reflexes, makes, you, uh, makes your reflexes better, actually. Makes you more aggressive, makes you sleepy. Uh, sexual activity and mental acuity. What is it? it increases your sexual activity and mental acuity. Uh, dopamine makes a smoker feel satisfied and calm. Uh, thus, a cigarette both excites and tranquilizes at the same time. People continue to take in the tobacco toxins because it is a social ritual. Uh, there's also a ritual aspect of the lighting up and smoking. Smoking is perceived as an adult activity. It manipulates, it manipulates your mood um, by increasing the dopamine level. It appears to be rebellious. It is sexually attractive, according to some people. Uh, controls your appetite, leading to, to weight loss. Uh, and nicotine is, of course, craved. Nicotine suppresses the appetite and increases metabolism. The average smoker weighs six to nine pounds lighter than the same size non-smoker. 
It may be the fear of putting on weight that keeps some smokers from stopping. Smokers may also be self-medicating to combat depression. Smokers are twice as likely as non-smokers to experience major depression. Smokers who have experienced at least one major episode of depression are less likely to succeed in smoking secession. Nicotine creates an intense craving uh, when a select level is not maintained in the bloodstream and, and in your brain. The mere act of lighting up activates the nucleus accumbens, giving the smoker a sense of reward. The rush is similar to the feeling that a heroin user gets when they relapse after an abstinent period. Uh, this, use to es uh, this use to escape withdrawal symptoms is called negative drug reinforcement. Only a few hours of smoking leads to neural ad adaptation to the toxicity of nic nicotine. The first morning hit after a long night's sleep is said to feel especially rush-like as the individual builds the nicotine level back to their daytime norm. Unlike other drugs, nicotine does not continue to build up a tolerance, but the smoker finds a level of comfort that they attempt to maintain. And this is one of the reasons why when people smoke, usually they will smoke the same number of cigarettes every day. Uh, and this is so that they can get that much nicotine uh, into their system. So if you have somebody that smokes seven cigarettes a day, they'll smoke seven cigarettes every day. If they have an especially anxious day, they may smoke eight, but they're not going to smoke a whole pack of cigarettes. And then the next day they smoke two, two cigarettes, and the next day they smoke a pack and a half. It doesn't work that way. Uh, the individual, that would, that would make the individual probably sick. So what most people do is they smoke exactly the same number of cigarettes every day. Withdrawal from nicotine causes headaches, nervousness, fatigue, hunger, severe irritability, poor concentration, depression, increased appetite, sleep disturbances, and intense nicotine craving. Sorry, I was getting a drink. The individual has experienced a true physiological dependence as the individual has created an excess number of nicotinic acetylcholine receptors that are screaming to be occupied. Without the nicotine to occupy these sites, the result is irritability and discontent. The smoker needs the tobacco to feel normal. Researchers now realize that the feelings of relaxation and well-being that smokers feel when they light up is actually the feeling of having the withdrawal symptoms subdued. So it isn't it isn't the tobacco that makes you feel good. It is the fact that your withdrawal symptoms are going away. That's why you smoke so much tobacco. Nicotine addiction is a more powerful addiction than any other. While 23 people, million people have tried cocaine, only 600,000 people are weekly users and a rare few on a daily basis. 72 million people have tried marijuana, but only 6.8 million use on a weekly basis and only a fraction on a daily basis. 198 million people have tried alcohol, but only 48 million use it weekly and only 20 million on a daily basis. 162 million people have tried tobacco, 60 million smoke weekly, and 37 million smoke daily. Nearly one quarter of the people who try tobacco continue to use a drug daily as compared to the fractions with other drugs and 10% of the people using alcohol. 80% of, 80 of smokers say they want to quit. 10% want to limit the amount they smoke. Only 10% of smokers want to continue, yet 100% do continue to smoke or chew. Other countries have more serious problems with tobacco than the United States. Uh, China's use is about 50% higher than in the United States. England's use is 40% higher, and Japan's use is also 50% higher. Globally, 12% of women and 47% of men smoke. Uh, there may be a pre predilection uh, to use tobacco. The DRD2A1 allele is seen as the culprit. A teen who smokes is three times more likely to abuse alcohol, eight times more likely to abuse marijuana, 
22 times more likely to abuse cocaine, only 8% of black teens use tobacco, 15.7% of Hispanic teens use tobacco, and a whopping 25.7% of white teens use tobacco. Nicotine contains from 4,000 to 48,000 chemicals, 400 are toxins, 69 are known cancer-causing substances, Worldwide, it is estimated that smoking causes 5 million premature deaths per year. 392,000 of these people are in the United States, 264,000 men, and 178,000 women. It uh, causes uh, such uh, problems as lung cancer, heart disease, and lung disease, also known as COPD. An additional 50,000 people die from secondhand smoke. 8.6 million Americans have at least one serious illness caused by smoking. It is estimated that a smoker will lose 10 years off their life by smoking. Smoking accelerates the process of atherosclerosis by increasing low density fats, increasing blood coagulability, uh, triggering cardiac arrhythmias, reducing micro-respiratory function by introducing carbon monoxide into the bloodstream. The uh, carbon monoxide is 230 times, uh, uh, has a 230 times uh, stronger affinity for hemoglobin than uh, O2. Carbon monoxide, of course, is one, uh, one atom of, uh, of oxygen, whereas... Um, Oxygen is, is two, two atoms. Because of that, carbon monoxide has a stronger affinity for hemoglobin. Therefore, if you take it into your body, then it uh, will attach itself to the hemoglobin. And once uh, hemoglobin has been uh, tainted with carbon monoxide, it, you can't use it for O2. It does not work. It will, it will forever, if it's uh, blood... Uh, red blood cells usually last for about 200 days in your system. Uh, if you uh, taint it with carbon monoxide, uh, then it will, for 200 days, you will have a useless uh, red blood cells cell uh, circulating through your system because the affinity is so strong for carbon monoxide. It's also a vasoconstrictor. Uh, one third of all uh, smoking deaths are due to cardiovascular disease. 335,000 of these are from secondhand smoke. Bronchopulmonary disease are far more prevalent among smokers than non smokers. Uh, that includes emphysema, chronic bronchitis, and COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Children who live with smokers suffer from more asthma, more colds, more bronchitis. 80 to 90% of all COPD deaths are due to smoking. Men who smoke are 22 times more likely to develop lung cancer than men who don't. Women who smoke are 12 times more likely to develop lung cancer than women who don't. 85% of men and 75% of women with lung, uh, with lung cancer smoke. Equality, women comprised only 26% of lung cancer deaths in 1979. Uh, in 2002, they had increased to 42.8% of the deaths. That's a joke, but that's not very funny. <laughs> About 15% of mothers smoke during pregnancy. Nicotine and the byproduct, carbon monoxide, change some of the positive properties in the blood. Carbon monoxide blocks oxygen transport, as I said before. It has a greater affinity for hemoglobin. And once a red cell is, is tainted, uh, it uh, can will never transport oxygen. Nicotine makes uh, platelets more sticky, increasing the po possibility of a, a clot forming. Babies born to smokers have lower birth weights. They have a higher incidence of uh, SIDS. Uh, women who smoke during pregnancy are twice as likely to miscarry and house, have spontaneous abortions as non-smokers. Children whose mothers smoked during pregnancy have a four times greater chance of having ADHD. They also have a greater affinity for possibility of developing conduct disorder, drug dependence, asthma, 
chronic bronchitis, and chronic respiratory symptoms. Smokeless tobacco uh, can be as addicting as smoking because tobacco and smokeless tobacco forms uh, contains more nicotine than smoked tobacco. People use more smokeless tobacco when they use. Smokeless tobacco has a higher pH, allowing it to pass into the capillaries more readily. One dip of smokeless tobacco delivers the same amount of nicotine as three to four cigarettes. At least the dipper is less likely to, to get lung cancer. However, the gums are inflamed from use, causing more dental problems. There's a higher risk of oral cancer, pharyngeal cancer, esophageal cancer, cheek cancer, and gum cancer. Famous people that have died of lung cancer, a uh, famous singer in the 1950s was Nat King Cole. Uh, Cole was one of the first African-American uh, TV stars. Uh, he was a heavy smoker. He died of lung cancer at 45. The leading man of the 60s and 70s, Steve McQueen starred in such movies as The Great Escape and The Sand Pebbles. He was a heavy smoker all his life. McQueen died of lung cancer at age 50. One of the blonde bombshells of the 40s and 50s, uh, Gable was a famous pinup for World War II soldiers. They liked her sexy legs. As you can see, she has sexy legs. Uh, smoker to keep her figure, Gable died, uh, Grable, I'm sorry, Betty Grable. Uh, Grable uh, died of lung cancer at age 56. Humphrey Bogart, he was known for his raspy voice and tough guy image. Bogart starred in films in the 40s and 50s in such films as Casablanca and the Maltese Falcon. Uh, his heavy smoking caught up with him in 1956 when he died of lung cancer at age 57. Known as the youngest Beatle, uh, George Harrison was the first to die naturally at age 58 from lung cancer. Uh, John Lennon had been murdered in 1980. Harrison was a smoker and toker most of his life. Uh, a lot of cigarettes and, and as much marijuana as he could get his hands on. Benefits of quitting using tobacco. 20 minutes after quitting, blood pressure and pulse rate drop and the feet and hands warm to normal temperatures. Remember, it's a vasoconstrictor, so smoking a cigarette may make your lungs feel warmer. But because it's a vasoconstrictor, it constricts the uh, circulation in your extremities. With eight hours, within eight hours, the carbon monoxide level in the blood drops and oxygen levels increase, uh, both to normal. Within 24 hours, the risk of sudden heart attack decreases. Uh, those of you who were in my have been in my class know that a couple of years ago, a, a, one of my best friends uh, had a heart attack. Uh, he was a smoker. Um, the last picture, he sent me a picture on Facebook of him catching a fish and he was showing off his fish and he had a cigarette dangling out of his mouth. I thought I had talked him out of smoking a couple of years before, but uh, evidently I was wrong. He died of a heart attack. The two of us had exactly the same heart attack in exactly the same place. Um, I, of course, survived mine without any damage, and he died from his, and that had to do with the fact that he was a smoker, and I have never smoked. Within 48 hours, the nerve endings adjust to the absence of nicotine while the sense of taste and smell return. That's not completely true. I have smoked a handful of cigars in my life, I guess, so I have smoked, but not to any extent at all. I like him. He used to smoke a pack of cigarettes a day. Within one week, breathing improves and constricted blood vessels begin to relax. Uh, within two to 12 weeks, circulation improves. Uh, lung function increases up to 30%. Uh, and the complexion begins looking healthy again. Within one to nine months, uh, fatigue, coughing, uh, sinus congestion, and shortness of breath Decreases the lungs, uh, increases their ability to handle mucus. Within one year, the risk of coronary heart disease has been cut in half. Within five years, the heart disease rate has become that of a non-smoker. Within 10 years, the lung cancer rate drops to just above that of a non-smoker. 
within 10 to 15 years, the disease rate has returned to that of a non-smoker. So it takes you uh, about 15 years uh, to recover completely. It takes you at least five years uh, before uh, the probability of heart disease goes away. Lung, lung cancer uh, drops continually until you're about the 10th year. And then you're completely healed by, by 15 years. And that is the end of our chapter, okay? A uh, fascinating chapter about stimulants. Next week we will tacker, tackle whatever chapter four is about. Chapter four is about opiates and opioids next week. Okay, so, so there you go. Uh, stay safe and I'll see you guys next week.